I grew up in a military family, which, as any barrack brat will tell you, means we moved around a few times while I was a kid. The second time was the summer between 7th and 8th grade, and it sucks so much harder than the first. I guess things are easier when you're in single-digit ages, but at that age, moving away from all my friends hit me that much harder. We'd known each other all throughout elementary school, and then through most of middle school too, and we were mostly set to all graduate high school together as well. So as you can probably guess, moving across the country and having to start all over again was not my idea of a fun summer. When it finally came time to starting school, I didn't know anyone, while everyone else had known each other for two years. Needless to say, I felt like a real outsider and even worse, I was being treated like one too. Pick a reason, kids found a reason not to like me for it. It was a real clicky ninth grade and I wasn't getting into any of them anytime soon. And that's why when someone finally did throw me a bone, I was incredibly grateful and relieved. His name was Todd and he had also been a transfer student just the previous year. He'd said he'd been through the same cold shoulder treatment that I had, but that it was cool because who'd want to be friends with people like that anyways? Todd seemed to have a reputation as being a weirdo loner type, but people were probably saying that about me too, so it just made sense to hang out with him if he was offering friendship. Not to say he wasn't kind of weird, he really was. He talked about all sorts of crazy grown-up sounding stuff that honestly got really boring sometimes, but he definitely wasn't a loner. He wanted to hang out every chance we got, and as much as we weren't the best of friends, hanging out with Todd definitely beat being alone all the time. After all, being alone made you a major target for bullies and safety in numbers and all that. At first, hanging out with Todd was just something I did at school, and we never saw each other outside of it. But after a while, Todd asked if I wanted to hang out at a local arcade with him. I always wanted to go to the arcade, but I was scared to go alone, and going with Todd formed a solid friendship in no time at all. I used to get a few bucks from my mom in cash and quarters, but then Todd would always share some of his money too. We used to play that time crisis game, the one two people could play at once, and since it was more fun to play with a partner, he'd always share a couple of bucks with me so I could carry on playing way after I'd normally have just failed. We started hanging out a lot after that, mostly in the arcade, but sometimes at other spots in the same mall the arcade was in. One Saturday, while we were getting some lunch at a Burger King, Todd mentioned having another friend in town that he hadn't told me about yet. I correctly assumed that they didn't go to our school, but I also assumed that they'd be around our age and similar in personality to Todd. But then the more I talked to Todd about his friend, the more he sounded kind of off. Then he mentioned how his friend would give him a ride places, and I was like, how old is this kid? Todd's friend wasn't a kid at all. He was 28, at least Todd thought so, and he had his own house somehow. Not his mom and dad's place where he lived in the basement or whatever, he had his own place. I asked why a guy in his 20s, late 20s, wanted to hang out with a couple of 13 year old kids and Todd just told me something along the lines of, I don't know, he's just cool I guess. Todd then made me promise not to tell anyone what he was about to tell me and when I did, he leaned across the table and said, He'll give us beer. I'd never really thought about drinking or something or anything like that before, but when I asked Todd, he told me beer was just about the best thing a person could drink. He said it tasted a little funny at first, but then the more you drank, the better you feel. I knew my dad and uncle enjoyed a few beers whenever he was over, and they'd always seem to laugh a lot whenever they drank, so why not try it for ourselves? The following weekend, we agreed to meet up at the mall before heading over to this guy's place. His name was Matt. Looking back on it, I don't think I really believe Todd had an older friend like that, especially one who'd risk getting into trouble with the law by giving kids like us beer. But the only way to know if he was lying or not would be to agree to see it for myself. Again, Todd makes me promise to keep the whole thing a secret, but once we met up at the mall... He almost immediately walks me out to a bus stop and we catch the first one that comes along. Todd seemed really excited to introduce me to Matt and as much as there was still a chance that it was all just a bunch of nonsense, it was looking more and more likely by the second. 
We get off this bus in this endless, identical-looking suburban sprawl of sorts, you know, walk a few minutes, and then we come to this one sketchy-looking house. Or rather, it wasn't sketchy-looking so much as it just looked like kind of crummy and not as well looked after as the other houses. We walked up the driveway, rang the doorbell, then this guy answers the door. Todd says, Hey Matt, this is the kid I was telling you about. I didn't say anything, but I was kind of amazed. Like I said, I actually thought that he just made this whole thing up, or at the very least, exaggerated his friendship with the guy. But nope, he'd been telling the truth the whole time, and he proved it when he casually asked Matt for a beer for me and him, and Matt said sure. We went and sat on the couch in front of the TV, and I remember there being some baseball highlights on or something. Matt then said that he wanted to go take a shower and we were welcome to make ourselves at home. I thought it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever tasted in my entire life and passing the can to Todd for him to finish it. I figured that he'd be happy to have more beer since he clearly enjoyed it so much, but to my surprise he reacted in almost the opposite way. He seemed disappointed I didn't like it and kept pushing me to give it another try and push past the initial bad taste. Looking back, he was obviously trying to get me drunk, but at the time, I had no idea why he might want to do that. A few minutes go by, and I hear Matt's voice from upstairs calling up for Todd. Todd goes to talk to him for a second, and then comes back to ask if I mind being on my own for a while, because he has to go help Matt with something. I told him it was fine, but that I might just leave if it was all the same to him. I told him the beer had made me feel like I was going to barf, but really I was just getting really bad vibes and I wanted to go home. Matt asked me to stay, then begged me to stay, and I knew something was wrong from the way he was acting. It took me a while, but I managed to get back home by taking buses across town, and when I did, I told my dad about what had happened in Matt's house. I remember choking up and almost crying because I didn't know how to communicate it, but Something was very wrong in that place, I just didn't know what. I knew it had something to do with the beers, and I knew it was wrong for us to have been given them. So much as it had made me feel like a tattletale, I told my dad where the house was, and we drove over there. Once he was sure of the house, we drive to the nearest payphone and just call the cops, then drive back to the house to watch what had happened. Dad wanted to watch the guy getting busted, and I needed to be there to point him out, so... We drove back. The cops arrive, they knock on the door, and I kid you not, no one answers. One of the cops then peers through a crack in one of the curtains, then they both run around back while screaming, Police! Police! Stop what you're doing! I don't know what was going on there, but I didn't see Todd at school anymore. In fact, I didn't see him ever again, and... I think it truly had something to do with what Matt was doing and the fact that he was now going to jail for a long, long time. One of the craziest events of my childhood occurred not long after I switched elementary schools. My dad ended up quitting his job when I was nine and we moved across the country so he could set up his own business near San Francisco. Obviously this meant that I'd be starting at a brand new third grade class and let me tell you, I was not fond on the idea. I've always been an introverted kind of guy and my one prevailing memory of childhood is being painfully shy around new people and places. Making friends didn't come as naturally to me as it did to some other kids, so the idea of having to start all over again was something I remember dreading. Anyway, cut to me in this new third grade class, full of boisterous eight and nine year olds who have known each other for years by that point. I remember feeling tense, like anything I did was going to cause everyone to burst out laughing at me because I'd broken some unknowable taboo to them. I spoke to almost no one, tried to remain totally invisible, and waited until the opportunity arose to try and make some friends. Then one day, during an indoor recess, this group of three boys decides to start doing karate on the lid of a bug jar. We had these big glass bug jars in class, one that had a bunch of little green bugs in it, I think they were aphids or something, 
and the other for roly-polies or pill bugs or whatever you want to call them. On this particular day, one of the jars was empty, so being the stupid kids that they were, this one group takes off the red plastic lid that had all these tiny holes in it, and they start punching and kicking it while taking turns holding it up. They were clearly trying to do that thing where the kung fu master breaks a brick or something with just one kick or punch, but their low strength and the hardness of the plastic meant that it wasn't even budging. I was just watching them for a while, then one of them notices me watching, and I'll always remember this. He asked me, Hey new kid, are you strong? I just shrugged in reply, then he invited me over to punch the plastic lid to see if I could break it. I didn't really want to do it, but you already know what I'm about to say. It was a chance to make friends, so if it hurt... It hurt. And it did hurt. A whole lot, actually, and I didn't even give the thing my hardest punch. I was mainly focused on not accidentally punching the kid's finger as he was trying to hold it up for me, because that would almost certainly ruin my chances of ingratiating myself into their group. The point is, I did it, and it kind of worked. The kids seemed impressed at the scratches on my knuckles and how I didn't cry or tell the teacher. They too had little scratches on their fists, so it was a real one-of-us moment, you know. We kicked and punched it some more, stamped on it a little to see if we could do any damage at all, then left it with little white stress marks on the plastic. Not broken, but definitely damaged. After that, they let me sit with them, and I knew that I wasn't all the way in there, but the smallest bit of acceptance meant the world to me. I was the happiest I'd been since I found out that we were moving, but... Not minutes later, all that happiness came crashing down, and the least likely person imaginable was to blame. So I'm sitting there with my potential new friends, trying my best to fit in, but meanwhile, our teacher found the damaged plastic lid and found out who did it in the process. I don't know if she'd spotted us towards the end, or if someone had snitched on us, but either way, she figured out that it was us, and she decided to punish us. But then unlike any other teacher who might put our names on a naughty list, give us a time out, or call our parents to complain, this crazy bee decides to do something else entirely. She asks to see our hands and we show her, figuring that she's gonna go get the band-aids or whatever. But instead, I swear to god this is true, she tells us that the bugs that had been in that jar were poisonous, and because their poison had gotten into our bodies, we were going to get really, really sick. As you can imagine, this put the absolute fear of God into us and we start panicking and asking if we're going to die. I don't remember the teacher explicitly saying yes at any point, but she sure as hell didn't give us a straight up no. She kept telling us to calm down and that she'd go get the school nurse, but then in the meantime, we should, and I'm 100% serious with this, write letters to our families just in case anything happened to us. I was eight years old, and this absolute nutcase made me write a freaking death letter to my mom and dad. I just remember crying. We all cried. And the teacher was out of the room at this point, so kids are asking us what's up and we're telling them that we got poisoned and we might die. I mean, tears were just falling out of our face, so all the other kids are legitimately believing us and they're freaking out too. Kids are crying, trying to keep away from us, running out of the classroom. It was complete chaos. And all the while, me and my new friends are sat there trying to find the words to tell our parents that we're dying. It was wild. And because it happened so long ago, it kind of feels like it happened to someone else. But it did happen, and as you can probably guess, there were some pretty serious consequences. I remember that we were taken to the principal's office where the vice principal calmed us down, gave us some lollipops and told us that we weren't going to die. In fact, we weren't even going to get sick at all and she was going to get us band-aids for our cuts and scratches. Next thing I know, our parents start arriving to take us home and I remember my dad being really mad about something. I thought he was just mad at me and I kept telling my parents that I was sorry but I'll never ever forget this part as long as I live. We're in the car and my dad looks back at me, because he's got his eyes on the road and he's like, Listen buddy, we're not mad at you, we're mad at your teacher. She told you a lie today and we're very mad about it, okay? 
I didn't feel much better, so much as I just felt confused, and after the confusion went away, I got really mad myself. It'll surprise absolutely no one that the next day that regular teacher of ours had been replaced by a substitute who was replaced by a permanent teacher in turn by the end of the year. I don't know what happened to that old teacher, but I guess that she ended up moving to another town to get a job someplace else. The whole thing was quite a big scandal from what I've heard, so I wouldn't be surprised if she got hounded out of town for scaring people's kids. Now, it's definitely not the scariest story that you've ever been sent, like my life wasn't in danger or anything like that, but to think a teacher would scare a kid like that, that's pretty creepy, if you ask me. For high school, I went to a tiny school of less than 200 people. I started my sophomore year there, stayed until graduation. One day we were in band class, which was a small gym building that had been converted so that the rehearsal room was built into it. We couldn't hear the intercom system over the instruments, but my brother got a text from a friend saying, We're in lockdown. Why are you guys still playing? The teacher assured us that it was a drill and told us to practice like normal. Minutes later, someone else gets basically the same text, so we start getting scared and taking things more serious. We got into lockdown position, but I felt like something was super off and it wasn't a drill. I curled into a ball, hiding behind some large instrument cases, and started texting everyone I knew in the main building, asking as many questions as I could. A friend texted me saying that there were gunshots heard on campus. A few minutes later, she texted again saying that shots had been fired and one student was dead. I remember pushing the cases out of the way and walking into the main class area, but my knees wouldn't stop shaking. All of the other kids were laughing and joking because they thought it was just some drill, and I said, this isn't a drill. Gunshots were fired and someone's gone. And it got really quiet. I crawled back behind the instrument cases and texted everyone I knew, telling them that I loved them and I was so sorry if I never got to see them again. I was texting my now fiancé, telling him that I loved him. I'd never felt fear like that before, and I'd never felt anything like it since. I was covering my mouth with my sleeve, preparing myself to hear the gunshots and the sounds of my classmates being taken out, telling myself that even if I heard screams, I had to be quiet so that they wouldn't find me. Eventually, the lockdown was over and cops busted into the room. They made us dump out our backpacks and take off our jackets and shoes and... Then we were escorted out onto buses by officers with these huge guns. We later found out that it was a student who I had just had class with that had taken their own lives in the boys' bathroom, and he was only 14. The guilt I experienced afterwards knowing that if it had been worse, that my classmates would have died while I was cowering in a closet really messed with me. When I started high school, there was this English teacher slash football coach who stood out to me immediately and I'll never forget him as long as I live. He was a Vietnam vet, combat medic, big guy too, and said that he was good at it because he was big and strong enough to carry almost anyone in his platoon. He seemed invincible and we were all kind of scared of him at first, but then realized that he was just a big teddy bear and he fast became our favorite teacher. Everyone at school knew that he was a Vietnam vet, as he mentioned it in passing sometimes, but not in great detail until we were in a few weeks into the semester. I can't quite remember how it came up, but we started talking about the war, and someone asked our teacher what it was like. I remember he leaned back into his chair and just sort of looked at the kid, then at the rest of us in the class and asked us, Do you really want to hear this? There were a few muted yeses from around the room and a few other kids just sort of nodded. He goes on to tell us some super gory story about holding some poor soldier's brains in or something. That sort of thing probably happened, but he wasn't about to share it with a bunch of 14-year-olds. Instead, he just told us how unfair war was. You could follow all the rules, be the best soldier you could be, with the shiniest boots and cleanest rifle and you could still end up dead. It was just random, 
chaotic. He saw men become the worst versions of themselves and sometimes they died for exactly nothing. It wasn't so much what he was saying as the way he was saying it. We all watched this big football coach of a man literally shrink before our eyes, less resigned and more like hopeless. There was nothing undoing at all. It was something that he just had to live with. When the bell rang, he composed himself and told us to have a good day. We left, and he never spoke of it again. I never stood for the Pledge of Allegiance in high school. I don't hate on America or anything, I just thought it was kind of lame, but I did in his class. That flag was not cheap cloth, and those words were not hollow phrases to him. So out of respect for the people he tried to save, I stood and did the thing. I still think about him sometimes, and I wonder if he's still around. I hope he is. He deserves to have a very long and happy life for some of the stuff that he's clearly been through. My sixth grade self remembers vividly watching a classmate's mother burst into the cafeteria one day. She ran straight up to an 8th grade girl eating her lunch while screaming at her, then before we even had a chance to figure out what was going on, the lady starts dragging the girl by the hair and pounding on her face like she was freaking Khabib or something. We later found out that it was over the girl bullying her son, also a classmate of mine at the time, by teasing him about being a virgin. She'd done this on more than one occasion and had apparently been very explicit about it too from what I'd heard later. One of the nicest lunch aides I'd ever seen ran over and started restraining this woman mid-frenzy and ended up throwing her out of the cafeteria after quite a struggle. Obviously the woman was arrested and matter of fact was still in the cop vehicle hours later in front of the school building when the school day was over. Kind of crazy story to tell these days, and it's not exactly campfire material, but this was back when lockdowns were becoming a big thing, so that made the whole thing super scary to me. I didn't know if this crazy woman had a knife, or if she was targeting some random students, or just that girl. We all just ran to the edge of the cafeteria, and everyone else freaking out made it all that much scarier. This was all in the first week of middle school, too, so everyone was on edge for practically the rest of that entire year. When I was 10, there was this boy who had a crush on me, and not just a boy, this kid was a complete and utter psycho. He'd been transferred from another school district for violent behavior, not just a school, a whole district of schools, so... As you can imagine, I didn't exactly do a cartwheel when I found out that he liked me. At first, he wasn't strictly bad to me, but he couldn't get over the fact that I didn't want anything to do with him. So after a while of almost non-stop whining, I finally decided to give him a chance. While I wasn't very nice, to be honest. At the beginning of the lunch, I told him that we could be together, then I went to lunch, and when I got back, I told him it wouldn't work out. I was 10 and I just wanted to get rid of him, so I didn't realize how horrible I was. The disturbing thing was is that when I quote unquote broke up with him, he tried to choke me with a jump rope. I was talking to my friends and he came from behind and swung the rope around my neck and started pulling it. I couldn't breathe, but luckily my friends got him off me soon enough. And dear God was that the most disturbing experience I've ever had with other kids. I used to drive a school bus for a living. I get this new kid on the bus and he's seven. His first ride he grabs a girl that was getting off the bus from behind and pretends to cut her throat with his finger. Instant front seat, instant ride up. I talk to the principal about it, he tells me, boys will be boys. In the third day of this kid riding the bus, he finger guns several students in the back of the head, execution style. Not in a fun way either, in a real angry, clearly hateful way. That was a big write-up this time, and again, I take it to the principal. Keep him up front if you need to, he's probably just playing around. I get jealous when I hear about school bus cameras these days. Very jealous. 
You see, the next day, he does the exact same thing, but this time, the principal very dismissively tells me to just drop it, like it was me who was at fault. I wrote up the kid and the mother effing principal. This is when the proverbial crap hit the fan. I get pulled up in front of the district transport director, as in my boss's boss's boss. I'm warned that I could lose my job if I escalated things, but I was ready to lose it. I wouldn't be able to say I told you so if he pulled out a real gun one morning, you know? And long story short, there's a compromise. The kid rides the bus, but so does the principal. The first morning he's on there, sat next to the kid, the kid asks him, What do you look like on your insides? They're really close. I hear every word. The principal starts trying to teach the kid biology or something and the kid doesn't want to hear it. He just wants to know if the principal looked the same on the inside as his hamster did. I'm not even joking. I did everything I could not to slam on the brakes or take my eyes off the road to give the principal a great big I told you so you mother effer kind of look. The social worker ends up paying the mom a visit and she had a breakdown and says she can't handle it anymore. I know it seems like an understatement at this point but the kid had problems, big problems, and problems our teachers wouldn't be able to fix. I know he ended up getting transferred to some behavioral school someplace, not sure where. I hope they zapped the bat out of him there because the thought of all that hate in a grown man, it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I used to work at a preschool... We had this kid, we'll call him Billy. He was a nice kid, wouldn't hurt a fly, always thinking of others. And then we get this new kid in the group, we'll call him Bobby. Bobby also seems like a nice kid, but he's painfully shy. Billy being Billy, he goes over to befriend Bobby and show him around. They become fast friends and they start playing together. Bobby's mom comes to pick her up and we're happy to tell her that he's made a friend. Bobby's mom doesn't seem very interested, but... Whatever. The next day, Billy and Bobby are playing again. They're laughing, swapping toys, then Billy takes a toy from Bobby and everything changes. Bobby freaks out and starts choking Billy with both hands. You need to appreciate that four-year-olds don't just choke each other. They pull each other's hair, they hit each other, they throw things at each other. They don't two-hand choke another kid like they're Homer friggin' Simpson. And that's what we call learned behavior, meaning he'd seen it someplace and he'd seen it a lot. It caused a huge drama in the preschool for obvious reasons, but we also discussed Bobby's home life too. His mom seemed off, and that's putting it gently, so we decided to ask her when she showed up to take him home. Her first reaction was, what did he say? As in, what did Bobby say? We told him he didn't say anything. It's more what he did. She kept apologizing and promising that he wouldn't do it again, but then in the most delicate way possible, we asked about her home life. She told us to mind their own business and left. We later had to ask Bobby's parents to remove him from our preschool on account of no one was cutting his nails. The final straw was when he ended up mauling another kid, leaving bloody cuts down their faces. I still think about Bobby sometimes and I hope he's okay. But I also know that fairy tale endings are sadly very rare. I used to go to work at a high school with a severe bullying problem. So severe, two psychologists from Stanford came to study it for a semester. It was ingrained and endemic. The worst thing I had first-hand experience with was the case of a 15-year-old boy who transferred from a different school right around the start of spring semester. He'd been getting bullied mercilessly, and we knew that he was an at-risk student, so we tried to do the best we could for him. We suspended one of our main culprits and gave another a bunch of detentions to keep him out of the way during opportune times, but we couldn't stop everyone. The new kid just wasn't ready for it, and the kids at our school showed him no mercy at all. He cracked in about a week. The Monday after he first started, he waits until everyone is in the cafeteria, then walks in, puts on what looked like a very wet jacket, and then set himself on fire. 
It wasn't water. It was white spirit. My co-workers found the bottle outside the cafeteria afterwards. One of the cafeteria ladies rushed in with the fire extinguisher really quick and I think he only burned for about a matter of seconds and I remember thinking that he might be okay, but he was not okay. The jacket had melted into his skin, meaning the burns were way worse than they might have been if he'd used a different kind of jacket. I figured he'd pull through, but he died the next morning. School was closed for the whole rest of the week, so the kids didn't find out until the following Monday. But us faculty found out almost right away, and it was on the news not long after we announced the kid's death to the students. They were shocked, and a lot of lip service was paid to changing the school's culture of bullying and fighting. But it was just that, lip service, and nothing was ever really done about it other than give a few special classes on reporting incidents of bullying. Reports went up, but bullying stayed the same. Sometimes I find myself missing being a teacher, especially during the summer, but then I remember how some kids treated each other and I don't miss it so much anymore. I used to teach in the inner city. I lasted a year in my first job, then moved someplace else. The kids in my new school made the kids at the old place look like angels in comparison. I had a kid who had some serious anger management issues. She'd cuss me out, threaten me. She was a constant problem. She actually wrote me a note this one time and just left it on my desk. It said that she wanted to slit my throat and how it'd be worth going to jail for. I was told by administration that since she's being treated for ongoing behavioral problems that I should be patient with her. So I was. Everyone was. Until we found her in a fit of rage, strangling her mother and smashing her mother's face into the steering wheel of her car one day after school. And that's what it took to get rid of her. Viciously assaulting her own mother on camera. And if she was able to turn on her own mom like that, I think she was more than capable of making good on her threats to me. Another student was desperate for cash that one of my fellow teachers found herself at knife point in her own classroom. The kid took her purse, phone, and keys, and the cops chased the kid down but he wrecked her car and almost ended his own life in the process. But so much for zero tolerance policy. He was suspended for a month and was sat back in row two of the classroom once he recovered. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that he'd come back that first time. I thought that there must have been some kind of mistake, but there was no mistake. I noped out of that school district and that career after that. I remember moving to a new middle school, getting a lay of the land so to speak, and instantly noticing the psycho weird kid that I didn't want to be around. I mean, no one else wanted to be around him either, which was also a pretty good clue, but I had no idea how crazy this kid really was. I hadn't been at this new school for a full week when he got expelled, and if ever there was something to expel a kid for, it was this. So during art class, the kid, being his usual weird self, but not in a feel-sorry-for-him loner kind of way, the kid just being a total butthole. Anyway... The art teacher kind of snaps on him and takes away his brush because he's messing up the bristles by just jamming the brush onto the page. Again, not in a cool creative way, in a way that I'm going to be a butthole and wreck your stuff kind of way. So the teacher snatches the brush from him and the kid starts getting mad. He shouts something at the teacher and the teacher shouts something back and then the weird kid curses at her, something pretty harsh too. The teacher responds pretty calm at first and just starts clearing their desk while telling him, you're done, you're done, over and over again. She's clearly stressed out, but she's keeping it together, even with the whole class watching her. But then, the weird kid gets up and stomps off towards the classroom door. We think he's leaving, but he doesn't. Instead, he takes a turn towards the teacher's desk and grabs a pair of scissors, big scissors, sharp scissors. There was this audible intake of breath from the whole class as he picked them up, thinking that he was about to charge and start stabbing. But instead, 
He opens up the scissors so they're almost like a throwing star or something and then just hurls them at the teacher from across the room. The throw is wildly off and the scissors strike a girl in the face while flying through the air. I just remember how there was no blood at first. This girl's cheek was just split open like you could see all the pink flesh underneath but for a good few seconds there was no blood. Then suddenly there was a lot of it way more than I'd ever seen in my entire life, and when the girl saw it on her hands and skirt, she just passed out. The teacher cleared the classroom, the school was put into lockdown, and the cops showed up, then EMTs. It's a scenario a lot of you are depressingly familiar with, and we never saw that weird kid again. The girl was okay, just ended up with some pretty cool scar on her cheek, I guess. I mean, the memory of the whole thing must have been pretty traumatic, but... It could have been way worse if those scissors had hit her someplace else. One of the most messed up things I'd ever seen happened in a 6th grade middle school class. i just moved to this new town so I had no friends for the first couple of weeks and I just sort of kept to myself in this class full of absolute lunatics. I mean it too. These kids were nuts. I don't know if it's just because we moved to a crazy town or if there was something in the water, but these kids were absolutely nuts. Worst thing any of them ever did was maybe a week or two after I started in that middle school. This kid was messing around with scissors, like those safety scissors, though putting them to his nose and chin and ears being like, wouldn't it be crazy if I cut them off right now? The kid's just fishing for attention, and that wasn't even the kind of thing that would normally warrant an audience in that class, so people just shrugged it off and didn't pay him any mind. Then right as he puts the very tip of his tongue to the safety scissors, like right on the blade, this other kid leans in and just claps down on his hand. Looking back on it, most of his tongue probably slipped out of the scissors thanks to the little plastic safety guard, but... It must have gotten caught right at the tip because the next second, snip. The next thing I remember, there was just blood pouring out of this kid's mouth and he was letting out this just absolute nightmare of a scream. A scream is different depending on the shape of your mouth and I guess that kind of goes without saying, but just try it. Stick your tongue out, completely out and just make a noise. See how much different it sounds. Well, imagine a scream in that same tone with blood pouring out of what used to be the tip of your tongue. So that image and that sound was literally playing out in my nightmares over and over for months afterwards. Moving to a new school is hard at the best of times, but you add a little PTSD into the mix and I wouldn't be surprised if I had a few gray hairs by the time I started 7th grade. Right at the end of middle school, my dad's company went under and we went almost completely broke. We had to downsize on almost everything, including our house, and I ended up going to a pretty sketchy high school due to the timing of the move. There were some really nice folks there, and some of the teachers really did give a damn about the kids, but they were just wild. The bathroom smelled like cigarettes 24-7, and the teachers gave up trying to stop kids from smoking in them. There was only one rule no pot or the cops get called, but other than that, they were like airport smoking lounges these days. Honestly, your eyes hurt just being in there. The thing that really shocked me was just how disrespectful the kids were to the teachers. This was just when cell phones were starting to get video recording technology and all that kind of stuff and you could buy one from some baby gangster for like $40 if you wanted one, and that meant that everyone had one. Some kids would literally record themselves saying insanely crazy stuff to the weaker of the teachers, like asking to explain what it meant to toss someone's salad, then laughing when they squirmed trying to talk themselves out of it. They also used these newfangled camera phones to record blurry videos of kids fighting, and my god were there plenty of opportunities for that. The worst I ever saw was between two 12th grade girls, I don't know what they were fighting over, but it was vicious. One had a bunch of gold hoop earrings in one ear, not the big kind, but smaller ones and multiple in each ear. The other girl got her on the ground, grabbed those hoops and pulled as hard as she could. 
I'll remember those screams as long as I live. And then the next thing, the girl on top sort of falls off the girl on the ground and when she gets up, the whole vibe of the watching crowd just changed. The girl who's been on top was holding the other girl's ear in her hand, the hoop earring still in her grip. I don't think she even realized because she actually took a moment to look at it before throwing it down into the ground. You might expect a person to just get out of there if they just torn another girl's ear off, but she didn't. The girl started stomping a hole in the girl on the ground like that's what you get. And that was the one time my parents legitimately considered pulling me out of that place in favor of just homeschooling. Knowing that I was exposed to that level of violence and knowing that it was happening all the time, I was actually okay with that at the time. I hated that school, but the principal and school board made a huge deal out of trying to reassure the wider community and I ended up staying until graduation. I have plenty more crazy stories from that place, but that was by far the worst that I saw while I was there. One of the most traumatic memories of my childhood was starting fresh at this new elementary school. I was desperate to make new friends, and there was this other fairly new girl there too, so naturally we just kind of gravitated towards one another. For the next few days, we sat together, had lunch together, and we went almost everywhere together. And then one day, we went to computer lab. We walked in and all the computers were sleeping with their black screens, and everybody sits down at the same time, moves the mouse, and all the screens come to life around at the same time, blinking lights all around the classroom. My friend then looked all panicky for a second. She falls off her chair and then starts shaking with her eyes wide open. It was the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. I thought she was dying, and when all the teacher did was walk over and hold her, I started to freak out. I started screaming about how someone needed to call 911, but none of the other kids moved. I kept screaming at them to do something, but they all just sat there staring at the teacher and my shaking friend and doing nothing. My brand new best friend, and I was about to watch her die right in front of me, and I just lost it. And that's when the teacher shouts my name, tells me to calm down, and tells me that my new friend is just having a fit. I have no idea what that was at the time, nor did I know what epilepsy was when I first heard the word just hours later. But that's what it was. My new friend was epileptic, and although it was real scary, it was harmless if there was someone there to take care of her, either her parents or a teacher. The girl didn't like talking about it, she thought it made her weird and that people wouldn't like her if they knew, but I still liked her. I thought she was the bravest girl in the world learning to live with something as crazy as that. First day of university in September of 2007, well, not first first day, but first day of lectures, there was an escalator leading up to the student center and I was riding up behind this girl that was texting away on her phone and not really paying attention to what she was doing. And then, out of nowhere, someone at the bottom of the escalator hits the emergency stop button, apparently just as sort of a prank. This means the escalator comes to a sudden stop and because the girl in front of me was both unprepared and not holding onto the railing, she fell mouth first into the corner of one of the steps. She was screaming, blood was pouring out of her mouth and she clearly lost a few of her front teeth and it looked like her lips were shredded up a bit. The mass amount of blood didn't make that clear. I'm standing over her trying to think of what I can do to help her and in less than 10 seconds she's completely surrounded by people trying to help. Someone slowly helps her up and seats her on one of the benches. There was nothing left for me to do and Already there were like a dozen idiots standing around and gawking at her without really doing anything, so I just decided the only thing respectful to do would be to awkwardly just leave the scene. Felt really bad for her, though. Many years ago on my first day working in a new elementary school, I saw two first graders playing a game you could roughly call pets. They were taking turns being the pet and the owner, all very innocently at first, 
but then one kid decides to try and use his scarf as a leash and ties it around the other kid's neck. I didn't see that part and turned around right around the same time the kid was turning blue. And that's the scariest part about working with little kids. They keep almost ending their own lives or their peers and they never understand just how close to death they really are. It's always the wobbliest toddlers who try and climb furniture too. You can't take your eyes off of them for even a second or the next thing you'll hear is thud and screaming. This whole thing went down in a high school boy's restroom, so reader discretion is advised, and although it's not exactly the scariest thing you ever hear, it's most certainly creepy to me. One morning I had diarrhea, really bad, and right as I got to school too. I thought that I managed to get most of it out before first period, but by second period it was back with a vengeance. I managed to keep it together until just before lunch when I basically ran to the first floor restroom which just so happened to be a full of special ed kids. They always used to get taken to the bathrooms before anyone else, for reasons that might be obvious to some. Not to talk badly of them or anything, but that's just the way it was. Anyway, I'm kind of terrified to go with these kids around because if my diarrhea makes any noise, they're bound to start laughing and making a big deal out of it and that's the last thing that I want. I walk into a free stall, then just wait until I hear everyone leaving the bathroom. Then, when it's finally quiet, I drop my pants and go to work. So I was in my stall, doing my thing, thanking God that there's no one around to hear or smell the monstrosity that's coming out of me. And that's when I notice a slight crack in the stall door. Not a big one, just enough to get a little light through and how a section seems darker than the rest. And that's when I see it. A single eye staring back at me through the crack in the door. One of the special ed kids had somehow managed to hide from his teacher and stayed in the bathroom, and now he was just standing there, staring at me. As you can imagine, I got a nasty case of stage fright, and any other time I think I'd have just pinched it off and gotten out of there, but I couldn't. This was the kind of poop that you can't just stop pooping, so I had to just look down, avoid eye contact, and do the best I could. When I walked out, the kid didn't even pretend like he hadn't been staring at me. He just stepped back slightly to let me pass and then kept watching me as I washed my hands and walked out. He was this little skinny ginger kid with glasses and a vacant look on his face. If he hadn't been a special ed kid, maybe I'd have said something, but I was this awful combo of creeped out and just, well, I felt really bad for him. Creepy kid didn't even realize that he was being creepy probably. Remembering having Jim with diarrhea gives me chills, but more so remembering how the special ed student stared at me through the door crack, and it makes me wonder what he got up to after I left, you know? Again, I'm not trying to dunk on him or anything here. There are plenty in our school, and they were all good kids as far as I could tell. There was just one, that kid, who always used to creep me out. He continued to stare at me, by the way. Like, whenever he saw me, to the point my friends were like, I think he likes you dude. They were just making a silly joke and I've never told them about him staring at me in the stall. If I did they'd have just laughed even harder but if it actually happened to them instead of me I don't think they would find it so amusing. Hey friends thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, I'm about the bus.